this year, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, and then we'll open up a town hall conversation after the panel discussion. Uh, so the cameras will be off during the first 30 minutes uh, discussion, but you can drop comments and reflections in the chat. Uh, there won't be a formal Q&A for, the, for that particular, for the first portion of the program, uh, but we'll ask you to carry some of the you know, reflections and thoughts for the breakout sessions and the town hall afterwards. So welcome, welcome all of that. Um, so, you know, we'll be recording this event. We are recording this event. So if you don't wish to be recorded, please turn off your camera at this moment. Um, and we're also offering live captioning for this program. Uh, in the second half of the program, we'll split folks into the breakout groups. Uh, so if you use live caption, we'll make sure that you're in the group where there's the um, person uh, there. So uh, make sure that you message Tiara Austin. So you just can search through the chat function, her name, and you're able to let her know that that's what you wish. So you, she's able to put you in the right room. Um, all right, so there's some quick, you know, uh, uh, housekeeping things for tonight. Um, and just want to start tonight with a uh, our land acknowledgement, you know, as we join the bed neighborhood of Central Brooklyn, the laundromat project respectfully acknowledges that we are on the occupied and unceded lands of the Canarsie, who are part of the Muncie Lenape. We recognize them as the original stewards of this land and pay respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Uh, we also invite you to honor the land and indigenous cultures, whatever you may be, uh, if you're not in New York City. Um, so with that in mind, you know, I want to us to you know think about the this program tonight so um the right of citizens of the united states to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the united states or by any state on account of sex congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation uh, i was just reading reading from the uh 19th amendment uh so ratified on august 18th 1920 uh this amendment granted some uh, predominantly white, middle upper class women, the right to vote. Um, and about a year ago, the Park Avenue Armory and a, with a team led by Avery Willis Hoffman uh, and the National Black Theater uh, wanted to celebrate, explore, question, and you know, uh, think about this, this, this particular uh, anniversary. Um, and and they wanted to bring a lineup of complex, you know, artistic voices to use art as ways to reflect upon the past uh, women's right to vote in the United States while being grounded in the present moment. Um, with that task, they invited the Laundromat Project alongside 10 other organizations throughout the, across the city. Uh, so we were able to commission art projects that would become part of the 100, 100 Years, 100 Women Project. Um, so that, you know, we just uh, did that a few months ago in August and uh, we were so honored and uh, to be able to be working with um, these five amazing artists uh, tonight. They're all here. Uh, so Abby Dobson, Latasha Dix, uh, Karina Aguilera, Skibirsky, uh, Jamie Sun Wu, uh, and Catherine Tukey. They created an amaz amazing work. Um, and all of that is, you know, we'll share some of the links to some of the resources you can able to experience their work online on the archive and our website. And also you can see their bios, you know, also um, uh, we'll, we'll share that shortly. So that's your, some context of, you know, where we are and thinking about this, you know, this year where all of this conversations about voting and the things that are changing in this country. Um, is an important conversation to have an amazing, you know, uh, roster of artists. And it's through their vision that we're able to see, you know, new possibilities and perspectives and be inspired to imagine how far we've come. But also a reminder that even a hundred years later, there is work to be done to secure universal suffrage. So, so thank you to the, all of you artists, you know. Um, now uh, I will turn it over to our uh, moderator for tonight and I uh, want to welcome Ami Andrieu uh, from Mokara, uh, our executive director of Mokara. Uh, <laughs> Amy um, is the executive director of Mokara, the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora Arts in Brooklyn. 
Uh, she's also a veteran global programming and campaigns across print, web, mobile, video, and live events uh, that are grounded in the arts and social justice. Uh, we are thrilled to have her lead us in conversation this evening. And without further ado, I want to hand it over to Amy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, am so honored to be in community with all of you. And a thank you to Kemi and Aisha and the full team at the Laundromat Project for creating such an engaging program. Um, it's exciting to talk about these things and to actually give us platform to discuss these topics. Um, so again, I'm honored and I'm excited. Uh, for the commissioning project, I wanna kind of step back a little bit. For the commissioning project uh, with the Park Avenue Armory, you are asked to reflect on the 100 year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which granted some, <laughs> not all women, uh, the right to vote. And each of your work uh, platforms uh, women of color with regards to the subject. And I'll do the same throughout the evening, pulling quotes from various women who are carrying the baton, carrying the fight, uh, who are crucial in this moment. But when I think about your work and how you've developed this work uh, during an election year, uh, at a time before we would know what the outcome of this election would be, um, I'm curious where you stand now when we're thinking about what the world is today and what the world may look like tomorrow and how so many of our rights are, as women of color, are still in question and still a topic of conversation. So when we talk through some of these points today, uh, I'd love you to keep that lens. Uh, so we'll talk about, of course, voting in the 19th Amendment, but we'll expand outward. So Abby, if we could start with you, I'm looking for you on screen. There you are. <laughs> I still have goosebumps listening to you sing. Still have Thank goosebumps. <laughs> and uh, your project sister, Outsider, of course, you know, I, I thought of Madame Audre Lorde uh, yes. and her essays and her work and, you know, just her phenomenal voice. Um, and every time you said, I'm not your beast of burden, I'm, I'm not just an angry woman. I kept thinking about a particular quote that she said in an essay, uh, a 1981 speech where she says, uh, it's called, the speech is called The Uses of Anger, Women Responding to Racism. And she says, women responding to racism means women responding to anger, anger of exclusion, of unquestioned privilege, of racial distortions, of silence, ill use, stereotyping, defensiveness, misnaming, betrayal, and co-optism. And she continues, and she says, but for corrective surgery, not guilt. And I'm curious, does this quote speak to you and what your process was in, in terms of creating your project? Um, and if so, what does correcting mean for your work? Wow. <laughs> we got to start off strong now, um, Abby. <laughs> um, I, to be honest, I'm not sure I understand the last part of the question. Um, but I'm not going to ask you to repeat it. I'm just going to. Well, we can yeah. talk it through. Essentially, you know, there's this idea that women of color, we, we have a right to be angry, mm -hmm. right? We have a right to be angry because of all of these things that have hap happened um, uh, in terms of stereotyping, co-optation, distortions of silence, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but Audre Lorde has a way where she says, you know, this is not to impose guilt on the other, right? Mm -hmm but this is about corrective surgery. It's about changing the lens in which we view womanhood. Who's a part of this idea of womanhood? And I'm wondering, what, how does that apply to your work? It applies absolutely uh, categorically to, to this piece. Um, I'm not your beast of burden. I'm not just an angry woman is, I think, something that every, um, Black woman in particular has felt um, in this country after, you know, beyond a certain age. Um, I think you probably experienced it as early as uh, being in grade school when, when, when some of us get pushed out uh, because of how we express ourselves. Um, the piece is very much a response to mis, uh, misrepresentation. Um, it's definitely a response to people not seeing us. Um, and more than anything else, not being able to feel with us and for us. Um, 
And so I agree with, with uh, Mother Lord that, um, <laughs> that I'm not interested in guilt. I agree with that. I am interested in empathy and substantive empathy, um, real nods to wanting to understand what my walk is as a black woman, as a woman of color and, and correcting it, correcting it in ways that matter, correcting it in policy, correcting in how you treat me, correcting it in how you um, talk about me, correcting it in how you um, uplift me um, and sponsor me quite frankly. Uh, to do things that 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 I care to do and want to do, and I say when I say I, I mean royally, we collectively, we yeah. collectively, yeah, exactly. So it it it's, it's spot on. I wasn't inspired by that particular piece, but inspired by uh, Lord's work and certainly what piece. Were, what piece were you inspired by? Yeah. Well, just Sister Outsider as a as a as a whole as a whole, yeah. Um, as a whole, yeah. Okay. Did you want to continue? Because I know I interrupted you. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, no, I just think that's a great quote. Um, and I think it's spot on. And it very much captures uh, the, the tone of the piece, which is to respond to um, the ways in which we are made not to belong uh, in this country. And, and, and so that also gets at the question of, of citizenship and, and suffrage and uh, the question of, you know, whose America is this? Who does America belong to? Um, and who has a right to, to sing America, um, embody America, be America. Absolutely. And I think uh, Karina's piece actually speaks to that as well with um, Vote by Mail specifically, talking about the legacy between mother and daughter and those experiences of voting. Um, it made me think about my own uh, family as a first gener. Um, and my mom came here as a teenager from Haiti um, in her lens of what voting is versus my lens of voting, two completely different things. But this idea of voting is wrapped in our Americanness completely, right? And I love what you said just now about whose America, essentially whose America is it, right? Um, by the way, everyone, you can jump in at any time. <laughs> I'm, I am going to pinpoint questions to each of you, but if you feel the need to, to express yourself, please do. I see Nata uh, Latasha just, unmuted so feel free to jump in um so yeah uh for me when i think about uh vote by mail in particular um i thought about angela davis um and i thought about uh you know black and immigrant women alike have the moral obligation to restrict the size of their families what was demanded as a right for the privilege came to be interpreted as a duty for the poor and i'm wondering if that's a link uh, to your piece, uh, Karina, at all. And what yeah. does it mean to be, and what does it mean, uh, what does voting mean for the immigrant woman today? Yeah, no, I I love that, and I'm going to look that up. <laughs> I'll send it to you. <laughs> I, don't know it. I don't know it, and I should. Yeah. Um, but that is the question that I was thinking about, because there's so much, you know, there's, there. I think there's so much misunderstanding or assumption about immigrant voices and how like well read they are how you know knowledgeable they are how you know they're following along and have their own kind of um ideas and positions and that th those are not you know th they're I, I guess I was really thinking about those assumptions and mm -hmm. I wanted to give my mother that voice because I thought her, her and I always do this in my work anyway, it's always like it, it, the entry point is always kind of audio back biographical, but to talk about these like larger issues. And so I thought she um, would be an interesting candidate in, in, um, in that, uh, I guess in that idea. And I was thinking a lot about, I was thinking a lot about, you know, the hundred year anniversary and where, and, and, you know, I, my father is first generation, but Jewish. And so his mother would have been, my grandmother would have been alive at that time um, and following along. And my grandmother in Ecuador would have been 
you know, having a completely different situation, right? And so I was really thinking about what, what their, what their, what that moment was, and I wanted to juxtapose it with the misinformation around, uh, around immigrants and their, uh, their, the reasons that they vote or don't vote. And then juxtapose that with the moment of like how important the vote was um, for this like momentous, probably most important election, I think that I, I think I've ever experienced in my lifetime. I'm not that young. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll ask this to all of you, um, you know, was working on this project in particular uh, cathartic? Was there, was there a healing that, or a healing process that you were going through to, uh, to approach the work? I mean, that's, I'll ask, okay. yeah, go ahead, La La Latasha, go for it. Right. <laughs> Thank you for thank you, Karina, for putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, cathartic, uh, yes, uh, for uh, for one reason which hasn't come up, uh, which is uh, the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. I, for me personally, uh, the pandemic at the very beginning. Um, followed by uh, the, the deaths of those who we know died f immediately following. Um, it froze me. Um, it froze me in a way where I struggled to imagine what I would contribute to this project. Mm -hmm. And, and, and how necessary my point of view would be to it. Um, and, and so the process happened outside of New York City and it happened in a backyard. And what I began to think a lot about was my mother um, that while we are obviously celebrating the many names that we all mutually know, that we all collectively know as um, playing a role in various movements, not just the suffrage movement, um, there are the names of those like my mother who are unknown. They're, they are the names of workers um, they are the names of the domestic workers, the maids, the filled hands, the laundromat women uh, who may have not been in the position to march, um, who may not have been in the position to even vote when they were given the, when, when the 19th Amendment was uh, ratified and even later with the Civil Rights Amendment. Um, and that, or the Equal Pay Act, for that matter. Equal Pay Act, <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, I felt it necessary for me in acknowledging those women um, in my performance, um, and chopping a lot of wood, which was very cathartic. That um, act was amazing, by the way. <laughs> 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 uh, um, 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 and um, because it was, it was a lot of anger. I gotta, I mean, I gotta say it. I mean, I think the beauty of everyone's contribution um, uh, to this is that we, we, we honed in on a particular mood. Um, and my mood was anger. You know, it was anger, it was exhaustion, it was frustration. It was a question of um, when does the work end? Um, yes, the repetitiveness uh, of it too. Yeah. yeah, when does the work end? I mean, and and to answer your question from earlier that you asked us to think about, um, 
uh, there's more work to be done. There's so much work to be done. I think about the work that we're all aware that Stacey Abrams and her team are doing. And we pray for her. We pray that, you know, her health stays, you know, good, you know, that her heart remains strong, physically strong. Um, and we think about the, the number of volunteers who did countless hours of phone banking, countless hours of knocking on doors, um, the number of um, volunteers that went into Arizona and made the flip possible, just simply by talking to these communities, particularly indigenous communities, and getting them the right information. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And it's like, we're still chopping. We yeah. are literally still chopping wood. Well, here's a question for all of you. I'm going to quote Grace Lee Boggs on this one, guys, uh, whom I love, Detroit activist. Um, I know she's no longer with us, but I am still a major fan of her work. Um, in her book, The Next American Revolution, she says, women's leadership in the public sphere didn't come from the White House or from CEOs. It came only after millions of women came together in small consciousness raising groups to share stories of our second sex lives. I'd love to hear your opinion on that, especially Jamie, with regards to equality too, because I think you could touch on that a lot in your piece. Um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, guys, in terms of coming together. How, how do women come together, women of color come together um, when we are always seeming to be the ones doing the work um, and overwhelmingly in large numbers? Um, for instance, you know, black women voters across America recently, the Navajo Nation, Latino voters coming through in Arizona. How do we stand in community with um, majority white women uh, who are voting in support of, let's say the current administration uh, and for candidates who don't have our interests in mind? How do we feel safe in that space? Yeah. Um... <laughs> I know, I'm like, <laughs> come on, save the world, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess what was really inspiring was to just learn about all the different women who um, fought for suffrage and just um, fought for civil rights after as well. Um, and that working in community what is not new like I feel like sometimes mm -hmm. when people talk about um uh yeah organizing now it feels very like it kind of feels like people are constantly reinventing the wheel um and feeling like you know uh what is bracketed as let's say like an Asian issue versus a, a, a black issue versus a like all of it's so um sort of like uh bracketed where where a lot of these issues all interconnect and are kind of absolutely place um so and we have to raise each other we have to support each other's issues yeah because and, they're one and the same yeah yeah and often um you know they're all they're all still inter pretty interconnected um which is what i try to achieve for equality t um like for instance uh mabel pinguali fought for suffrage in Chinatown when, you know, it was pretty clear that <laughs> it, you know, e even, even with the um, 19th amendment, it was just impossible for Asian Americans to vote. And that didn't really happen until 1952. So, um, and just because of the Chinese Inclusion Act and all of that. Um, and of course there was like the Latinx suffragists as well who are working on this. And then all the way from the beginning, Native American women were already um, very much uh, part of the democratic process in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So um, that was nothing new. And they were teaching, actively teaching suffragists um, on how, how to rise up. And so um, just kind of see it like really reaching all the way back and thinking about how people came together, even when they knew that they might not directly benefit, but that they were kind of um, contributing to one step toward that milestone um, was really important to me because sometimes it is really um, discouraging to be like, okay, I'm doing all this work, but I'm not seeing the results for what I think is my community. 
Uh, but when you see the larger picture and you're looking at the history in retrospect, you can see how all those contributions led to something greater. Absolutely. And they, lad they laddered up to this moment where we can all convene together, actually, mm -hmm. and continue doing the work. Um, thank you for that, because I actually really, really enjoyed Equality T. I feel like I learned so much from that piece. You know, there are moments where you feel like, I'm a feminist, I know everything about all of us. Uh, and then you realize, oh, wait a minute, I did not know that. Um, and it urged me to kind of dig deeper. So I want to say thank you for that, for sure. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I did lots of reading. <laughs> like, <laughs> all, the, all the books, I just ate all of them up. <laughs> Well, I'll definitely be tapping you to get like some links <laughs> for sure. Uh, Catherine, I don't want to forget you. Um, you're inspired by the work of Sojourner Truth, um, whom I love as well. Um, and I wanted to quote her really quickly and ask you about what you feel about this quote in particular. I have done a great deal of work as much as a man, but did not get so much pay. I used to work in the field and bind grain, keeping up with the Cradler, but men doing no more got twice as much pay. We do as much, we eat as much, we want as much. I'm curious, you know, given the fact that your work speaks to uh, what was happening in Egypt in the textile industry simultaneously as the suffrage movement, um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that quote and how that might apply to your project in particular. Yeah, so um, <laughs> thanks for asking that question. Um, yeah, I didn't really, I wasn't sure what was going to come of this project. I just knew I had to do a lot of research and digging. So I was doing that during lockdown and struggling like everyone else with just how to focus on this project, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I mean, it was about suffrage, but it's, it's about like survival and so many other things as well. Um, so one, I knew after reading and researching, Sojourner Truth had to be in one of the collages because she is um, like a rock and a foundation. And that's how I perceived her for what we now call intersectional feminism. So, and just, you know, reading the little excerpts that I did from her speeches and the one that you just mentioned, um, she really just embodies that truth that her like right to live and be alive and thrive is is not separate from it's not like um, compartmentalized into all these like different struggles like it's not like she was going to like fight for suffrage and then you know fight for abolition separately and like all of these things kind of like come together and the quote that you just mentioned is about labor you know and equity in labor and that's something I still think about so much today, especially as an artist and an arts worker. And many of us are dealing with unemployment um, as a result of the pandemic. So it's just like this long legacy <laughs> um, in the United States and, and worldwide when you're talking about exploitation of labor and resources. Um, and I think that that quote ties in perfectly with those issues. And, you know, suffrage is like, like one one link in the chain, but I don't, you know, I don't see it as the most important one. I think like we have to push for for so much that you know. Hopefully, this the new administration will allow us to do that. But um, as much as I, <laughs> I like had a sigh of relief after this election, I was like, we got to keep chopping. <laughs> you know. Right. The wood, the wood still there <laughs> gotta <Right>. do it <laughs> yeah but you know keep, keeping that thread in mind guys you know where are we now and what do we what are we dreaming for you know um what do we want are we looking for a matriarchal society do we want to return to that um have we left that what is our dream for the moment a hundred years later since the ratification and this is for everyone do we want to start with abby first and go around? Sure. Um, what am I looking for? I'm looking for um, a world where our dignity as human beings is recognized. Um, and part of what, you know, my piece was about, you know, was one section of it. Um, was inspired also by Sojourner Truth and her speech, Ain't I a Woman? And mm -hmm. 
even though that's the f refrain that I kept singing, it was all for me the, in, in the back of it is, ain't I a human? Ain't I a human being? Um, and the future for me that I think we all need to get to is, is that recognition of our humanity and our dignity as human beings, and our equal right to dignity. And that shows itself up in, in, in you know, how we compensate people for their work, how we value what people do, how we value the everyday steps that people take, regardless of, um, you know, the cultures, um, you know, apportioning of, you know, um, esteem towards something. I'm very much inspired by, because these are the people that I come from. My grandmother was a domestic worker. This is this is this is who is one of the people who most define who I am as a human being. Um, their walk. Uh, matters to me, um, and we live in a society where people don't value them with equal, with equal, um, you know, regard for their dignity as human beings. And we see that across the board, from what they're paid to whether they can participate in the same way as other people because of the the, the labor that they have to do and 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 the the leisure that it doesn't afford them on on so many levels. Um, so for me, how can we treat people like human beings and recognize our dignity as human beings that's beyond any kind of identity that you could have? Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. I, and I also, I was thinking about uh, even the right to choose, <laughs> you know, uh, something of just ownership of our own bodies. Uh, we have to negotiate, which we shouldn't have to, right? Uh, Karina, your thoughts, what is your dream? This is gonna be the final question, guys, before we get into the town hall. So I wanted to give room for everyone to kind of chime in on this. Well, I mean, I think that as, um, as I, I, you know, in some ways, like identify more with my mother as I get older, the, the two things that, sh that I think really come from her are a sense of fairness and a sense of justice. and. I think, you know, she, she believes in that for everyone. Like it's, it, she's outraged when she's been outraged for the last four years. Not that fairness and justice were in great supply before four years ago, but there's something about the, the kind of, um, blatantness or um, aggressiveness against justice and fairness and like a complete reversal of that that has been so debilitating like in 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 a you know in a kind of consciousness way or as a country um, in a collective way and so I guess I, for the future, I, I would love to see justice and fairness, you know, for everyone, not just a kind of um, exalted few or a powerful few because of their position. Amen. <laughs> I'm just like, yes, I'm writing these down, hoping that we can create our own constitution. Uh, <laughs> Catherine. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> I, I'm just thinking all these things are so important that everyone has said. And, and it's like, we've been saying them for so long, <laughs> you know, and not even us, like so many generations before us. And so how is it actually gonna work? How is it actually gonna happen? And I think, a big piece of that needs to involve self-determination and needs to involve solidarity and horizontal organizing and you know not waiting for anyone to make it happen for you but reaching out to the people around you starting local and building up power you know from the people um, honestly like not not sitting around waiting for a government to do it cuz they're failing <laughs> like they failed Miserably. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Latasha. Mm, so um, 
I have some notes that I wrote earlier, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna try and paste them into, <laughs> I guess, an answer. Um, and so it's a it's two parts. So one has to do with love. Um, I love I love me. I'm coming into loving me. I'm coming into loving others more because I love my mom. You know, I, and, and recently, just last night, I watched this PBS documentary and I highly recommend it on the first rainbow collision. Um, and that, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine myself doing as much as these individuals did. But when you look at that and you th think about the, the, the under levels, it has to do with like, we have to get to a point where we love each other, where we love each other and we see that we are all experiencing the same things on the other side of the yard, which goes into the part two. Um, we have to have a serious conversation about capitalism. Uh. You know, capitalism festers on the exploitation of labor. And, and, and there's no way ends about it, you know? And I, you know, I can't, I don't know what our two newly elected leaders are thinking about within that. I, I know I understand this country to a certain extent. And I also understand that um, in the next couple of decades, there are going to be certain uh, populations um, in crisis um, if we really don't have a hard conversation about it um, and a conversation as to do we want to uh, continue this roller coaster, this treadmill. Um, because we have, to, we simply have to, because, and uh, I'm fl flubbering, we have to because that's going to be part of loving ourselves and loving our communities and loving our outer, our outer communities, our extended communities. Unafraid, unabashedly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and we've got a planet, I'll just add. <laughs> Wait, say that again? I said, and our planet. And our, and planet. our absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because she's one of us, actually. <laughs> and Jamie, I don't want to forget you, your dream. Uh, yeah, I second everything <laughs> that everyone said. Um, so I'll just get real specific. <laughs> just to just <laughs> put it in, um, uh, fill it in. Um, this is very specific, but I really want ranked voting <laughs> yes. um, because we can never get out of a two party system unless there's ranked voting. I don't know why voting for the candidate I want is going to, you know, even for the primaries, like wh why can't I vote for someone I truly believe in? Why do I have to feel like it's a throwaway vote? You know, um, I hate that. I hate that I can't just vote the way I want because there's no ranked voting. Um, the other thing that I, I dream of is just to, oh, can I explain ranked voting? It just yeah. means a, a lot of other countries do this. So basically, um, if you can rank who you want to vote for in order of preference, and if the first uh, choice doesn't get the popular, you know, the most votes, then it'll just default to your second choice and down the list. So um, that's why you don't have to, like, there's no vote wasted really because your vote will be counted no matter what. Um, and it'll just go to whoever got the most votes within the ranked setting. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm a big fan of ranked voting. So we're not stuck with a two party system where we can't actually voice our real opinions. And I also um, dream of just, um, just specifically with voting. Like I, I just wish there wasn't so much voter suppression um, and especially with this election, just hearing about, um, you know, how 
mail in voting is fraud, even though it's all about accessibility and like safety during a pandemic, just the most obvious reasons why it should be okay. Um, the idea that like people were doubting whether they could go to polling places safely, like these are all things that when we were research, like I was doing my research for this project, I was thinking, oh, well, you know, there's gerrymandering, there's all these things, but at least we don't have to deal with like people bringing guns to a polling place, you know? Right, <laughs> and now. <laughs> thought, oh my God, that could be a possibility. Or there's people like screaming outside protesting at polling places. I was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. <laughs> like, I, I, I thought that this was kind of behind us. I, at least just like the sanctity of being able to go to a polling place and not feel like you're in complete danger. Um, so yeah. So I dream of a day where we can vote with our mind and vote for, with, with our heart for real and um, actually and no election. act. And, and then maybe more people will come out to vote. <laughs> yeah. And no electoral college. Uh, no electoral college. Shout out yeah, to Abby. That's so you can post that too. <laughs> that too. <laughs> that too. Um, thank you guys so much. I know we're like running over right now. I just want to say one more thing. Um, I want to quote uh, Audrey Lord one more time. We are women forced back always upon our women's power. Let's not forget that. Let's take that. Mo Let's take this moment uh, to set the next hundred years together, as you guys have all eloquently said. Um, you know, we can write our own constitution. We can lead the path forward. We can follow and stand on the shoulders of giants who have come before us and who have already done this work, who have left the lessons behind for us. Uh, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Thank you again for this opportunity, Kemi and Aisha. I think you guys are still here and the entire laundromat team, uh, laundromat project team rather. Um, and I don't know who I'm passing the mic to right now. Me. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, this is so amazing. So thank you for, thank, thank you, Amy, for your moderation. Thank you uh, to all the artists for your amazing, you know, vision and work and inspiring uh, ideas and just, just, you know, keep, keep the conversation going. So just, I know the chat is very active, so keep that going. Uh, and You're looking more and more every day like a Taino king. <laughs> for real. <laughs> um, this is my hair after the pandemic. Anyways, um, so thank you, Natasha. And I want to hand it over now to Kemi uh, and, um, and we'll continue with the next part of the program. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Abby, Jamie, Latasha, Karina, Catherine, uh, Amy, thank you for moderating and bringing in so many incredible voices, each of your voices, as well as Audre Lorde's and Sojourner Truth and so many people and your grandmothers and your mothers. I so appreciated that so deeply. Um, it feels like a time to meditate on legacy um, and, and women of color and the legacies that we be live in and are trying to build forward because there are days that I don't believe uh, where we still are and other days when I believe it very sadly and very deeply. Um, you guys spoke about intertwined issues and dignity and the purpose of work and the purpose of the walk. Um, dreams, thank you, thank you so much for thinking about dreams and dreaming uh, for us and with us. That is so incredibly important. And, I particularly think uh, for people of color, it is absolutely critical that we make space to dream um, and that we have a dream practice and a visioning practice because nobody else is going to do that for us or make that space for us. Uh, so, so deeply appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, and the second half of uh, this evening is taking everything we've learned um, and uh, being able to have a discussion uh, together. But before we do that, we have another um, incredible uh, uh, woman, uh, a black woman. Uh, we are celebrating uh, today um, 
in particular, so many of the women who helped us get here and the women who are continuing to do the work, again, Stacey Abrams and various other folks are mentioned today. One of the women who is helping us do the work in the here and now is Jen Epps Addison, who is uh, president and co-director at the Center for Popular Democracy. And we invited her here to give us a little bit of a I kind of called it a State of the Union address. Uh, she and so many of her colleagues and member organiza community organizations from around the country worked very hard to deliver the election that just happened. Uh, we know community organizing got us here. That all didn't just happen in one or two or even three months, but many years and decades. And uh, we're sharing a little bit of a bio about uh, 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 Jen in the um, chat. Um, which we didn't have a chance to share earlier, so you can learn more about her. And I'll turn it over to Jen to uh, just kind of give us a little bit of where we are and what, what the dreams and joys and possibility for justice and dignity are ahead of us. Thank you so much, Jen, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Cami. I feel like anything for you. So I'm really excited to be here. And I feel like this is, you know, I feel really kindred to everybody, all of the presenters and the a previous panel and folks on the phone. I knew that I was with my people when we started talking about the trappings and failings of late stage capitalism. I was like, yes, I'm home. This is my people. I can be who I am in this moment and in this space. So, um, you know, thank you for having me. I still, you know, I have so many reflections on this election and I'm actually still processing, you know, even as I posted a picture of uh, Kamala, uh, and was reflecting on the fact that my daughter ha now like can see someone who who looks like her, um, you know, in the White House in a position of power. Uh, you know, I still felt conflicted because uh, you know this election was about a number of things. Um, but uh, for us, right, we want to get on, right, get on to the the progress of building the country of our dreams, and we want to leave the idea that we have to be in defense of our people in defense of democracy behind. And I think this election reminds us that actually it is our, it, you know, it is, it is our, our, our struggle in life, our toll in life to both, you know, extend people's view beyond the horizon to really see, uh, you know, what is possible for ourselves and our communities outside of the limitations that oppressors put on us. Um, but also to really um, create the space in a system that was not designed and not made for us to thrive, right? Uh, to create the space for us to change those material conditions. And this election was about that in so, in so many ways. Um, for us as organizers, we are a national network. We work with grassroots organizations in 35 states, Puerto Rico and Washington, DC. And it was really clear early on in this, you know, all the way back into the democratic primary process that the conversations we normally have with our people about why they should turn out to vote, what's important, what's at stake, were gonna be insufficient um, for doing what needed to be done. That people, um, you know, yes, people were uh, clear that uh, the current president did not have their interests at heart um, and, you know, there was lots of talk in our communities about the sort of blatant white supremacy of the current president. But there was also a lot of talk in our communities about the fact that the ticket that was running didn't seem all that much more promising for the prospects of how we, you know, help communities of color really find true freedom in this country. Um, you know, I will say I've been working on elections uh, since I was an adult 20 plus years now. And I almost have, I can't even recall another election where real specific policy positions of the two candidates were discussed in such detail um, within my community, right? Like the, uh, you know, the uh, conversation around criminal justice, for example, um, you know, was a painful, difficult and hard conversation for us to have as we were organizing with folks and trying to mobilize the vote. Um, I remember real specific conversations on the ground in Milwaukee with folks who were saying to me, I went to jail because of the crime bill and I only got out this year, you know, because of the First Step Act, right? And so 
there were, there were deep intentional conversations. And I think, you know, that's where for me, cultural organizing, art, storytelling, narrative, all of the things that the Laundromat Project like brings together, um, community voice really, really mattered. And it actually, it's funny because I remember um, as I was doing work in Milwaukee during uh, GOTV, Get Out the Vote, the weekend before election, I remember thinking about a specific project that you all sponsored, um, which was at public libraries. And it was a boombox installation where the neighborhood got to curate the playlist. Um, and it really spoke to like what people were experiencing. And yes, there was like our traditional bops in our songs, right? But then there was also like, you know, real mu like music that really reflected kind of the struggle that the neighborhood was going through. And there were, I remember being told the story at one of your events about how there was tension, right? There was tension about this installation um, and the, the music that was selected in the playlist and this conversation about cens uh, cen uh, censorship and about voice. Um, and, you know, that is, it, I know it sounds like a stretch, but actually I really thought about that, um, you know, as we were going through this election, because many of us were being told to be quiet, many of us women of color that are now being celebrated um, you know, resoundingly, I think if folks remember, for example, when Stacey Abrams said, yeah, I'm, I'm in the running for vice president, like I'm putting my hand in the ring, how she got smacked down. And now everybody's like, she's the best thing since like sliced bread, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I really thought about that in this election, because we were constantly being told we can't talk about the, the sort of failures or the trappings of the, you know, of the Democratic candidates, because we don't want to, um, you know, <laughs> tip the scale in favor of the current president. Um, we were being told, right, to do the work, but keep our mouth shut about what our what we wanted in return. And, you know, to Abby's point about Black women being the mules, I mean, I think that it, it, it was a clear and explicit strategy of this administration, right, or of, the, of President-elect Biden's campaign for Black women to play that role, right? And now I think what we're seeing is uh, this incredible, uh, coalescing of Black women in different constellations saying, okay, we showed up, we did our job, but it will not be business as usual. We will act like we are actually in demand of, of something in return here. Um, and so let's, let's talk about this election for a little bit. As I said, you know, we want, our network desperately wanted to be in the situation in which we were having a transformative election, you know, in the same way that you know, the Republican Party will be forever transformed because of Trumpism and the, really the Tea Party before him, right? We were really hopeful that in this moment, as we were facing, you know, real like blatant authoritarianism, that we could have a moment of realignment for the country. Ultimately, what we got was a harm reduction strategy, right? We got a, a ticket that said, we're not going to be great. <laughs> we probably won't make anyone happy, but like we won't, you know, uh, purposely try to kill people or deny that COVID is real or some of these other things. So we got a harm reduction strategy. Um, and so it really, you know, meant for us to understand that in this election, you know, we, we knew really early on about three years ago, we started to build our 2020 strategy. And what we realized is that we could transform the electorate and we could change the outcome of the election um, without getting a single white voter to change their vote from 2016 to 2020. Um, and, you know, we focused really hard on the communities of color, particularly in seven, the seven states that were going to be key to deciding the electoral college, understanding that there were enough black and brown votes unregistered, but, but um, unregistered, but eligible black and brown votes in all of these states in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and uh, Arizona and Georgia to change the outcome of that state's electoral vote without actually having to change white people's hearts and minds. Not that we don't wanna do that, right? That's a very long-term strategy, but we knew that that would not be the thing in 2020 that was going to win us the election. And it turns out we were right, right? Joe Biden's strategy of working with the Lincoln Project and going after suburban white folks and rural white folks was an abject failure. In fact, those communities voted at a white, white women voted at a higher percentage for Trump in 2020 than in 2016. So they haven't learned that much uh, from us. But what did happen is we were able to uh, get people to really understand that this is not about you giving your vote to somebody. It's not about you doing anybody a favor when you participate. 
Um, it's about having a sober assessment of our power of flexing that power and then remaining united post-election as we begin to try to move from a position of defense into co-governance together in, in this multiracial democracy. And so our North Star at the Center for Popular Democracy is building a world where we all have the freedom to thrive. And as we look you know, past this election, past the history making moment, and there's so many things to feel good about, right? There are also some things to worry about. Uh, Donald Trump got more votes from every racial demographic group in 2020 than he got in 2016. There's a lot to unpack there. For black folks in particular, the top two reasons, if they were not evangelical black folks, right? The top two reasons why they shifted to Trump were criminal justice reform and the economy. So there's a lot, you know, as we talked, the previous panel discussed, like our conversation, our understanding of capitalism as a, as a tool, right, to move people out of poverty, to sort of bring people into the um, uh, American experience, like is, is fundamentally flawed. And if we don't begin to have these conversations um, and really tease these things out within Black communities, we could really be setting ourselves up in 2022 and 2024 um, for not just a resurgence of Donald Trump, but quite possibly for an authoritarian, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, installation that is a lot less uh, easy to defeat, right? Like that it isn't as uh, politically unsavvy as Trump is and therefore is much more difficult for us to defeat. Um, and so where do we go from here, right? Looking at our North Star, right now, I think the biggest challenge that we face, right, is that people in our country have been indoctrinated in the idea that they don't deserve nice things. And this is why I think art and culture are so critically important. When I think about some of the big difference makers in this election, I mean, I'll say the joy to the polls, right, that the Working Families Party did um, and Frontline where, and the Movement for Black Lives, where they really focused on creating a sensory experience through voting, right? So not just turn out, turn out, turn out, wait in line, don't you leave, but like created a sensory experience of joy and community and culture. Like that was really difference making, particularly in places like Philadelphia, where people were still waiting in line for four and five and six hours to vote. Um, I think about the cultural work of um, the New Georgia Project in Georgia, who really brought in two new constituencies to voting. Um, first, they did a, a, an entire project with it, the adult entertainment industry in um, Atlanta, particularly with exotic dancers, souls on the poles. Um, and they did a whole bunch of really creative digital work and, and, and artistic work with strippers, um, talking about voting rights and explaining the ballot process. They also did a very similar thing with gamers. Um, people of color and women make up more than half of the gaming community. I know we think of like incels, like in their room by themselves, like, you know, whatever, when we think of gaming, but that's just really not the case. And so they focused really hard on bringing the gaming community into civic participation, doing um, a ton of events on, on platforms like Twitch, one of the largest um, streaming and gaming platforms in the country. Um, and so, you know, what I want to say is, is when the story of 2020 is written, it will not be about how this, like, uh, you know, skate by, do no harm, nothing will fundamentally change strategy of, of Joe Biden was immensely successful. The truth is when the story is written, it will be that black and brown and indigenous people, that young people who participated at record numbers came together around a vision for this country and defeated one of the greatest threats to democracy in you know, the history of our country. It will be about how the people who were most uh, targeted by this administration and who, uh, bore the brunt of the burden of, of that oppression and hatred rose up together to create a different future for themselves. And so as we move forward, I'm excited to see particularly how our creators, how, how cultural folks, how, how you know, black and, and indigenous and brown communities continue to bring um, you know, that spirit and that energy that got us to the place that we are, that was able to overcome immense voter suppression, immense intimidation. I never thought in my lifetime I would see white folks with guns at polling locations. I thought that was just something we learned about in history. I had no idea it would come back, but here we were, right? 
um, and, and really deep misinformation, right? Deep misinformation about people's positions, about voting, about participation. We overcame all of that. And I think, you know, our cultural work was a huge piece of that. So moving forward, as we begin to talk about how do we build the country of our dreams? What are we gonna do to get people out of this pandemic with the most people alive and healthy as possible? How are we gonna rebuild an economy that is collapsing around us because of COVID and a number of other reasons? These are really, really big challenging um, you know, uh, issues to take on and it will require <laughs> like, it will require an artist's imagination in all of us, right? It will require us to like paint and envision and curate things that don't currently exist for us, you know, from our imagination and birth them into the world. Um, and I think most importantly, it will require us to be willing to keep telling our stories, to, to contextualize our stories, right? That this moment was, was not just about defeating Donald Trump, this moment was about building a country, building a democracy that is worthy of our families. Um, and that's the story we're gonna tell. And I think, you know, we, will, we absolutely understand that the cultural work, the creative work, the storytelling work is central um, to moving the country in the direction where we all understand, yes, we actually do deserve not just nice things, but all the things, healthcare and housing and education and an environment that doesn't poison us, all of the things, um, and, you know, help us get to the place where we're not just envisioning them, but we're actually winning them for our people in real time. Woo! Asha, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jen. That was amazing and just uh, really grounding for me and, and hopefully uh, everyone found something to hold on to there because we do absolutely deserve nice things and all of the things. That's gonna be my mantra uh, moving forward. Uh, back to those dreams. We need to dream and believe in our dreams. So thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you again uh, to our artists and everyone uh, who helped um, bring this program together and gave us something, all these different gems and things to chew on. And thank you, Jen, for really acknowledging the role that art and culture has really played in moving our world forward, both in this most recent election, but also historically. Um, so very quickly, we're now going to break out into groups. We'll be, they'll be led in small teams. Uh, you'll be in small groups led by create. Create Change Laundromat Project alum. That's our residency and fellowship program. So Laura, Atwe, Jennifer, and Ari will be leading each of these small groups. Tiara will gracefully uh, lead us into those. Um, our goals for this were to have a chance to collectively think about an, uh, the election, to think about issues of liberation, to create space um, for uh, to share related projects and initiatives and to seed coalition building. If there are things that you are excited about and wanna to continue to build creative actions, here's a community to do that with. Um, 